Kathy has been a parishioner since 1979, almost 40 years. She was director of religious education from 1987 to 1991. She was awarded a certificate by the University of the South for completing the theological education by extension education for ministry program and currently serves as a Stevens minister. Kathy has been the volunteer archivist here for more than 10 years, having been trained by Dick Hewlett, our former archivist and chief archivist at the Washington National Cathedral. She studied archival management, archival management for one year at University College Dublin in Ireland from 2016 to 2017, where she received a professional certification. Please welcome Kathy O'Donnell. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk about my favorite subject, which is the history here at St. John's. There's so much to talk about in just 30 minutes that I can only give you an overview of the in more interesting things I've found in the archives. Thanks to the efforts of my mentor and former parishioner, Dick Hewlett, the, who started the archives and literally wrote the book on parish archiving for the diocese, the records are available for all to see. They answer lots of questions such as, how many mission churches has St. John started? What was the name of our first newsletter? What year did St. John start? When did women in the parish get the right to run for office? The archives are made up of the voices from the past that can answer each of these questions and more. They, those voices have quite a story to tell. We'll start just nine years after Abraham Lincoln's assassination and eight years after the end of the Civil War in 1873 when Bethesda was just a small dot on the map and Wisconsin Avenue was just a dirt road. Anyone know who was president in 1873? Brand. 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 Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Members of the Dodge, Offutt, Oliphant, Drum, and other families rode their horses and buggies to St. John's Georgetown, St. Albans, or Labyrinth Church in Silver Spring, now Grace Church, for services as there was no Episcopal Church in Bethesda at that time. One can only assume their voices were heard about the trip to get there, so Lambeth Church decided it was time to start a mission church. The first service was held in the fall of 1873 at the home of J. Heath Dodge, with Reverend James Averitt from Lambeth officiating. After that, cottage services were held on weekdays in the homes of Mr. Dodge, Mr. Hillary Offutt, John Davidson, and Greenberry Watkins. Then Hillary Offutt's parlor was offered as a chapel until the chapel was built. In 1874, in April, construction began on a small wooden frame church on property donated by Colonel and Caroline Dodge. It was, it was completed in the fall with beautiful stained glass windows and dedicated by Bishop Pickney on the, of the Diocese of Maryland as St. John's Chapel mission of Lambeth Parish. However, Hillary Offit's parlor was still used for services that winter as there was no heat in the chapel. Colonel and Mrs. Dodge gave the land and asked that the church be named St. John's Norwood after St. John's Georgetown because they had attended there for years and Hillary Offit was on the vestry there and he had requested the name and Norwood, as that was the name of their family estate here. As noted on our webpage, following the completion of a trolley line in 1891 from the District of Columbia out was what was then called the Washington and Rock, Rockville Turnpike, the dirt road mentioned above, Wisconsin Avenue. Our neighborhood became known as Chevy Chase and the area began to grow. In 1895, the Diocese of Washington was formed and we moved from the Diocese of Maryland to the Diocese of Washington. At the Washington Diocesan Convention in 1896, the voice of St. John's was heard as a request from our vestry to change our name to All Saints because there was already another St. John's Church in Montgomery County. Despite that change, we were still known as St. John's 
and we started the mission church on Chevy Chase Circle called All Saints Mission. You can imagine the confusion that caused. So in 1903 at the diocesan convention, a resolution was passed asking us to change our name. At the 1904 convention, our voice was heard again as we petitioned to be named St. John's Norwood, and we've been known as St. John's Norwood Parish ever since. We were a growing church, and having been a mission of Lambeth Church in 1896, we now started our own mission in Garrett Park in a chapel known as St. James, which later became Christ Church Kensington. As I said earlier, we started a mission at Chevy Chase Circle the following year, 1897, under the name All Saints Mission, which is now All Saints Church. And in 1903, we started a mission in Glen Echo, which is now Church of the Redeemer. This is a picture of the laying of the cornerstone. And if you notice the two men on the far left, the first one is William Offit, and the second one is Reverend James Averett. In 19, let's see, in 1900, the first women's group was organized and named the, William, the Women's Guild. Its functions were similar to those of our present day altar guild. In 1902, a parish hall with a basement and a kitchen was added to the frame church at a cost of merely $1,300. <laughs> you can imagine what that would cost today. In 1903, our first newsletter, the, published, the first published voice of St. John's, was started by Reverend James John Cornell. It was called St. John, John's Record and consisted of three issues, which we have in the archives. In 1904, oil lamps replaced the, were replaced by electricity, both in the church and the parish hall. The women's auxiliary was formed and one could buy a picture of the church or a map of the diocese for 10 cents from the Women's Guild. And in 1910, land was given to the church for the building of a rectory on Old Georgetown Road by Joseph Bradley, the nephew of then rector Duncan. This is a picture of St. John's, probably taken around 1912 from the other end of the dirt road, which was and is now Bradley Lane. You can see St. John's in that arc up at the far left-hand corner at the top. Sadly, our frame church was destroyed by fire on May 29, 1914. The building was being painted at the time. Longtime parishioner Bob Hampton's father, Horace, was an eight-year-old eyewitness. As quoted in William Offit's book, Bethesda, A Social History, I had been down in Washington and I came out and got as far as the district line and looked up towards Bethesda and saw the sky all red. And I ran out to Bradley Boulevard thinking our house might be on fire. I was just a kid. The fire engine they had then was a 500 gallon tank on the chassis of a farm wagon pulled by a rope. It was kept up in a barn behind the store where community hardware later was. When I got up to Bradley Lane, everybody was sitting down, just watching the church burn down because they'd used up all the water and there was nothing else. After the fire, Walter Tuckerman offered his store for services until the new church could be built. The rectory, which I mentioned earlier, was sold to help pay for the new church. Our former mission, All Saints, donated $100 toward the building of the new church. A, new, a stone church was built almost immediately on the same spot. It was built facing Bradley Lane, as did the original frame church, and seated 168. You can see part of the new rectory, which was also built right next to the stone church. If you look to the behind it, the rectory was quite big. Here's a picture of the inside of the church on the left. Whoops, that's not the right picture. There it is. The, um, the inside of the church on the left and the recessional from the first day we were open for business. <laughs> 
Um, our second published voice, St. John's Call, began during the time of Reverend James Kirkpatrick and was published weekly beginning with the March 2nd, 1919 edition and ending on May 1st, 1921. Aside from stories and information about St. John's, it is full of paid advertising. <laughs> One of the first voices from the archives is from an article in the June 15th, 1919 newsletter about an automobile accident in front of our church, killing a pedestrian and injuring his wife. Do you know that in 1919 there were no sidewalks in Bethesda? It was of grave concern to our rector, James Kirkpatrick. I would like to read to you from his report from the newsletter. Two automobiles met on Rockville Pike at night, and because of the neglect of one to dim the lights, the other ran into these good people. The farmer and the automobile owner but want good roads and will pay for them to the extent of making an upkeep. But good roads mean the automobile and all the problems connect therewith. <laughs> The pedestrian is entitled to full protection in the use of the good road, but does he get it? Most assuredly not. He is like a hunted animal, leaping and jumping into the ditch at the blast of every horn. The building of simple sidewalks is not expensive. He ends with, don't vote for any man for county commissioner unless he pledges himself to this improvement, the building of sidewalks. Don't vote for any man. It's quite a sign of the times, isn't it? Sidewalks were finally built in 1927 when Wisconsin Avenue was widened. Copies of the newsletter are also in the archives. In 1917, the United States entered World War I. There is a plaque, a plaque <coughs> excuse me, for those who served on the wall in the tower entrance where they issued the healing prayer ministry. Uh, which was dedicated by the Vestry in 1919. I'd like to share with you a voice from World War I. The voice is one of a guest to St. John's, a chaplain Mackintosh. His very touching sermon was about the soldiers he saw at the Battle of Argonne in France. It was so well received that it was published in the 1927-1919 edition of St. John's Call. Here is a quote. The soldier will throw away everything that adds to his load or impedes him on the march, retaining the Bible or book of devotions. He cherishes them to the end, clutching them tightly in his hand with his last strength as, he's, as his eyes close in death. These instances illustrate the devotion of the soldier to his loved ones and confidence in his faith. And here, as he marches back from the battlefront, with his wounds and sorrow, his heartaches and memories, marches wearily down the roads leading to peace and rest for a while, with no sound but the tramping of a thousand feet in unison. The grandest orchestra of the world is at play, as angels carry the te deum of his soul to the harmonies of the Father's heart in gratitude for his care in snatching him and his buddy from the jaws of death." End quote. By 1918, by an act of Congress, by an act of the Maryland legislature, women in Chevy Chase and Christ Church Kensington parishes were given the right to vote. However, according to Hanson Whiteman's St. John's Norwood, for some reason, women at St. John's did not get the right to vote until April 9, 1928. By granting women the right to vote, it also meant they could run for office. The first woman on the vestry was Margaret Kaiser, who was elected in 1945. It took 67 years from 19, 1928 before the first female warden was elected in 1985, and that was Judy Cousins, who was elected junior warden with Robin Peary as senior warden. She became senior warden two years later with my husband Earl as her junior warden. Including Judy, there have been eight female wardens, including our present senior warden, John Astori. St. John's was in debt during the Roaring Twenties and for many years had no vote in the diocesan convention since we had failed to meet our quota of support. Before the Great Depression hit, the rector's salary 
was reduced from $3,000 to $2,000. Do you hear that, Sari? <laughs> 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 Subsequently, he resigned, citing the poor salary. The services of a janitor were suspended for five months, with property and the church being cared for by members of the vestry. The organist volunteered to take a deep reduction in his salary. However, by the annual meeting on April 21st, 1930, the church was again solvent and hired a new rector. Reverend Joseph Williams. A third published voice, Parish Notes, was started by Reverend Williams in January 1933 and was published on a monthly basis. By the fall of that year, issues were being published weekly. The last copy we have is dated August 26, 1973. We are missing several issues, but we have almost continuous copies of all newsletters dating from December 1955 to the present. In 1937, the kitchen was too small for the many dinners that were held there. So Mr. Martin and Mr. Whiteman improved the situation by removing two outside toilets and replacing them with modern inside toilets, which somehow increased the size of the kitchen. <laughs> During World War II, the rationing of gasoline and fuel had a big impact on our church, as the church was heated only on Sundays. The building heated to 55 degrees. Reverend Williams was in poor health and decided to retire, but stayed on until the end of the war at the request of the vestry, who hoped that we'd be able to find a new rector from the many chaplains returning from service overseas. He served until December 13, 1945. As everyone knows, under the presidency of FDR, the federal government began to grow, and so did Bethesda. Our church soon became too small. In fact, in the 40s, the space was so limited that church school classes were held in the kitchen. A building committee was formed to plan for a larger structure which would seat 500. Construction on our present church began in 1947, which was to be built with the stone church attached, and that church would be used as Sunday school classes and offices. In 1946, Reverend William Creighton, who, was, who I mentioned earlier, was hired as rector. There's a picture of him, his official photograph, and then one of him at play with his wife here at St. John's. He was a uh, uh, he served as a Navy chaplain in Normandy during World War II. He served from 1946 to 1959 when he was called to be Bishop Coadjutor of Washington and later Bishop of Washington. In a letter to Dick Hewlett on the dedication of the fountain in the Memorial Garden in honor of the bishop, his son Michael Creighton wrote of his memories of St. John saying, quote, I remember hanging out with the ushers after the service as they counted a mountain of coins, hoping for an Indian head penny. I remember shoveling coal in the old rectory, every one of my Sunday school teachers, putting things in the cornerstone of the church, people calling my dad on Sunday afternoons, thanking him for the sermon that day, hoping I would not lose control of that processional cross with the huge lead ball joining the cross and the staff. I remember our marriage at St. John's with Mr. Beale and my dad presiding. I remember the calls and caring that came from St. John's when my dad died in 1987 and how you kept my mother and our family in your prayers. Perhaps you too remember Reverend Crichton's sermons. They are in the archives if you'd like to read them. In fact, we have sermons dating from March 1954 to the present. Maybe you've heard from others about shoveling coal or worries about dropping the cross and staff. Michael Creighton, who served as bishop in central Pennsylvania, is now retired and living in Annapolis. He also stated, much of who I am today comes from formative experiences at St. John's. My commitment to building a Christian community and to serving ministry everywhere in God's great world all comes from experiencing it here at St. John's.
1945, enrollment in Sunday school had more than doubled. During the summer of 46, the guild started a program to take care of younger children on the church lawn one morning per week, the first Mother's Morning Out program. In 1947, the Mary and Martha Guild was organized to assist married couples who were both working, and ground was broken for our current church building. You can see the difference in the altar area then and now in this photograph. It's much smaller then. By 1949, there were approximately 1,000 families living in the Bethesda area affiliated with St. John's. Of that number, about 700 were active. By 1951, we were renting houses in the area for Sunday school classes and holding meetings in the old stone church. Now to the 1950s, when the voices of a group of ladies representing the women of St. John's were heard. The Women of St. John's, or WSJ as they were called, was organized in January of 1950 and melded all the various women's groups under one banner. Now back to the women's voices. They went to Reverend Creighton to speak about their, quote, this is their quote, desire to do something other than bake sales and stated they wanted to start a thrift shop, end quote. After a special meeting of the vestry on January 4th, 1951, the women were granted authorization to set up a shop for the sale of used goods to be sold to the public. The effort was organized by the WSJ under the chairmanship of Mrs. Thomas Semple with the advice and inspiration of Margaret Kaiser. In a letter to the vestry dated February 2nd, just four weeks and a day after the vestry agreed to the idea of a shop, the shop was open and the, because the women had worked out all the details. The original opportunity shop was located in a tiny cottage at 7230 Wisconsin Avenue in Bethesda. And oh, as I said, they opened that year on February 1st. It has relocated twice since then and has been instrumental in the community and as a part of St. John's since its very beginning. For instance, in 1951, using monies from the op shop, the WSJ purchased the rectory in Chevy Chase. In 1954, the first, the first every member canvas was started to raise funds on an annual basis for the church. We continue to grow and St. Luke's mission was established up on Old Georgetown by St. John's. Two years after that, we had another mission in Potomac, which is now St. Francis. St. John's hosted the Bloodmobile from the 50s into the 80s. In 1952, the Norwood Parish School was started in the church school wing with Reverend Beale and members of the vestry on, this, on their board, and some members of the class are here today. Basketball was played in Montgomery County Church League with games played at BCC High School. Bob Hampton was on our St. John's team in 1954 to 56. And John Simons played for the championship team of Chevy Chase Presbyterian at that time. <laughs> <laughs> they played um, St. John's in the championship and they won by a score of 16 to 14. High scoring game. <laughs> In December 1955, another newsletter was started, simply called Nor Norwood Parish Newsletter, published by Lou Castles, who wrote the religion column for the United Press International, or UPI. And the final issue was December 1968. As an aside, he wrote several books on religion, including A Christian Primer, which may still be in our library. In 1956, fundraising began for the office and church school wing. In 57, the old stone chapel was used as a library and as informal meeting space. And Reverend Creighton resigned to become Bishop Coadjutor of the Diocese of Washington. And Bill Beale became our rector. He was also a veteran of World War II, having served as an officer in the Navy. The 1960s were a turbulent time for the nation, to say the least. It proved to be busy times for us at St. John's. One of the things we did was to start a construction committee in 62 to build a chapel, and the startup money for that came from the legacy of Ida P. Young. In 
The chapel of St. Mary was dedicated on November 26 in memory of Miss Young, who lived from 1873, the beginning of our church, to 1962. In 1963, another one of our mission churches was started in the Montrose Road area and became St. James Rockville. By 64, there were 775 students enrolled in 36 Sunday school classes from nursery to high school. 775. Can you imagine that? This church, this, that was in 64. I'm sorry? That's right. <laughs> A lot of us are do wondering that too. The confirmation class and the girls choir pictured here give a hint as to how large the enrollment was. The first annual Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper was put on by the adults of St. John's Committee. The bookery was selling books between services. The WSJ adopted a Cuban refugee. Air conditioning was installed in the church. The youth traveled on a mission to Nicaragua supported by the WSJ. And here's a picture of the group. And if you look in the top left-hand corner, the woman there is our own Barbara Ordway. Also of note, the first fall fair was held in the autumn of 69. The 70s were another busy time at St. John's as we established the Bach Free Clinic in 1971, where band-aids and friendship were freely dispersed by volunteers and led by our own Dr. Bill Feller. The published voice of St. John's Revelations was started. The Concord Hill School opened in the school wing. We sponsored a Vietnamese family. And in 1973, we celebrated our 100th anniversary. St. Barnabas, St. Barnabas Mission of the Deaf started holding services here in October of 76. The women of St. John's Fall Fair became known as the Williamsburg Fair in 72 when Judy Cousins served as chairman. Joan Peary, Joyce Robb, Julia Rawati, and others also served as chairman over the years. Forrest Andrews did the artwork for advertising for the fair. You can see his work here and down in the archives. The fairs continued until 89. Women were not allowed to be ordained up to this point in the Episcopal Church. On July 29, 1974, 11 women were ordained in the Episcopal Church in Philadelphia against church policy. St. John's was in the forefront of the movement to have women ordained. Our vestry led by Senior Warden Paul Carew voted seven in favor, four against, three absent, one who would have voted in favor, to invite one of the women to come to St. John's and celebrate Holy Communion. In a letter to Revelations, Reverend Beale said no. It caused a lot of bad feelings at the time, despite his stating in the article, quote, the present discrimination against women in the priesthood of the Episcopal Church is immoral and unjust, end quote. However, what was not understood was that the bishop, Bishop Crichton, was the one who had said no. He was a proponent of women's ordination, but felt he had to ask us to wait. His own plan was that diocesan bishops already had the power to ordain women and that he would ordain women in the fall of 76, regardless of the vote at the general convention. Reverend Beale stated in the article, quote, my wish is that he would not wait that long, end quote. Thankfully, on September 15, 1976, at the general convention, women were approved for ordination in the Episcopal Church. Yay. <laughs> At that time, a parishioner since the age of five, Miriam Wendell, sought clergy and vestry approval to attend Virginia Theological Seminary. Her request was approved. Under Reverend Beale, several female deacons were part of the staff here. In 1975, St. John's lost the voice of Hanson Whiteman. He was a vibrant member of St. John's for 65 years, serving for 16 years as secretary to the parish and 18 years as senior warden. <laughs> he wrote the only published history of St. John's Episcopal Church, Norwood Parish, which I have copies of here, 
and in the archives. And there's also a copy in the library. Sadly, Reverend Beale died suddenly of a heart attack after services on February 25th, 1979. He served for 19 years, the longest serving rectorship in our history to date. During an exhaustive search process, Reverend Bob Daly and former parishioner, now ordained Marion Wendell, Reverend Marion Wendell, I should say, served as clergy until Duane Alvord arrived in September of 1980. Marion stayed on as Duane's assistant for two years. Marion was the first of many female priests here at St. John's. The 1980s were another busy time here as there were many changes under Duane's leadership. Several of the changes were controversial, to say the least. One of the first changes was to start having two separate services for main worship at 9 and 11 with church school classes and adult education after the nine o'clock service. The next change was having Holy Eucharist at each and every service and dropping morning prayer. In protest, many would walk out after sharing the peace at the service. Mm -hmm. There were other changes, but there's not enough time to go into all of them now. Montgomery Hospice was started here in 1984. In 87, ground was broken for the Memorial Garden and I started a Mother's Morning Out program here at St. John's for mothers in the parish and the neighborhood to have some time off. Robin Doherty, Jean Craft, and Nancy Durr were participants in the program, and Nancy joined the church then. Nancy had been church shopping, and as you know, Nancy became the head of the church school and led it for many, many years. Rob and Jean and their families were already long-term members at that time. The name of the program was changed to Parents Morning Out when fathers began bringing their children. Truly a sign of the times. The Oneness Family School moved into St. John's space in 89. Then we jumped to 1995 when major renovation of the church with the installation of the elevator, glass doors in front, improvements to the West Avenue entrance and other changes began after a very long capital campaign. In 1996, Duane retired, but work on the church continued. In September of 1997, later Susan Gressinger, later Flanders, became the first female rector here at St. John's. Under Susan's leadership, we had another capital campaign, which funded a new organ and renovated the altar area. She also started the Come As You Are service at five o'clock. The startup costs were funded by the Norwood Parish Fund. In 2008, she retired after serving 11 years. In 2010, Sari was installed as our 13th rector on November 14th, and our history continues. Whose voice or voices have you not heard? Many voices from the past are not heard because they were not presented to the archives. What I mean is that what isn't saved and given to the archives is not preserved for the future. Please consider giving your old files, pictures, any memorabilia you might have to the archives so that your voice and the voices of those you worked with here will be remembered in the years to come, especially for our 150th anniversary, which is just five short years away. As you can tell, we have a glorious and special history to celebrate. There's a lot more to our history than what I've spoken about this afternoon, but there's always something new and interesting to discover in the archives. If you would like to work with me in the archives, please join me, just let me know. If there's anything else you'd like to know about, please ask, and I'll be happy to try and answer. Thank you. Thank you.